Good day, everyone, and welcome to the final in our 2018 winter webinars from the Sir James Dunn Animal Welfare Center at the Atlantic Veterinary College in Prince Edward Island, Canada. I'm Dr. Alice Crook, coordinator of the center, and I'm very pleased that we have people from all over the world this year. Um, and I want to extend a particular welcome to the AVC alumni in the audience and also to the many vet students and animal health technician students from many different schools. Welcome, everyone. Before I introduce Dr. Overall, I'm going to go over a few things so you will know how to participate in today's webinar. First, it's a good idea to close all unnecessary programs or apps running on your computer. Here's a screenshot to show what you will see on your own computer desktop. Taking up most of the screen is the GoToWebinar viewer through which you will see the presentation. In the upper right is the GoToWebinar control panel where you can choose the audio mode and where you can ask questions. By default, you're listening in using your computer speaker system. If you would prefer to listen over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Note that your control panel will collapse automatically when not in use. If you want to keep it open, you can click the view menu and uncheck hide auto control panel. Here's a closer look at the control panel and how you can participate. You've all joined uh, the webinar in listen only mode, which means you are new muted. However, we welcome your questions or comments, which you can submit by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel. You can send them in at any point and we'll collect them and Dr. Overall will address them at the end of today's presentation. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be sent to you in a follow-up email from GoToWebinar within a few days. Veterinarians and veterinary technicians will be receiving a CE certificate within about a week of the last webinar that they view. Uh, this time, there's a short survey in the follow-up email and we welcome your feedback as well as any suggestions for topics for future webinars. Um, as usual, Dr. Overall has very kindly agreed to share her slides and you can get that right now. You should have access to that and as well, I will send it out in a follow-up email. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Overall to you. Um, she's given hundreds of national and international presentations and short courses and is the author of over 100 scholarly publications, dozens of textbook chapters and the texts Clinical Behavioral Medicine for Small Animals and the Manual of Clinical Behavioral Medicine for Dogs and Cats, as well as the DVD, DVD Humane Behavioral Care for Dogs Problem Prevention and Treatment. She's the editor-in-chief for uh, Journal of Veterinary Behavior, Clinical Applications and Research. She's a senior research scientist in the biology department at the University of Pennsylvania, where she studies effects of anxiety and reactivity on performance and mental health in dogs, and from where she is joining us today from her home in Pennsylvania. So now I'm going to change the screen, turn it over to you, Karen. There you go. Okay. Well, you would think that, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. I just asked it to share. Can you see that? Yep, there we go. Two okay. beautifully color-coordinated dogs on the PEI Red Beach. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's why I took it. They are exactly color matched to that beach, um, and it wasn't deliberate, but it's a stunningly gorgeous place, PEI, and I, I have to tell you, Alice, I can't wait to be back. Okay, so today we are once again going to have a very dense presentation and um, I'm doing this deliberately because I'm trying to make sure I, that people from all over the world, I realize there's a broad participation in, these, uh, in this seminar series. I'm trying to ensure that you get everything that you can possibly need for this topic, which is why I'm also providing a PDF of the slides so that you can go back over this yourself. And if you can't get the articles that in this talk and you really need them um, or would like to have them, please just email me. So today we're going to talk about emergent data in behavioral medicine, 20 findings that'll change the way you think and practice. And I've set these up um, in a series of lessons. So. I, I tend to think of a finding that makes me perk up and, and pay attention as a lesson that changes my life and changes the way I practice medicine. So the first lesson is that uh, we need to understand that we think we know, uh, that what we think we know may not be known or it may not be right. And there are many places where we can go wrong 
but the easiest place is with politically charged facts, okay? And this is an issue in all of politics, um, and I hail from the state, so I'll say no more about that, but it's also an issue in science. And Gary Petronic did an excellent job of bringing this issue to the fore, and this is a paper that is open access, and you can all get it, it's in the journal that I edit called Who's Minding the Bibliography? Daisy Chaining Dropped Leads and Other Bad Behavior Using Examples from the Dog Bite Literature. And this is one of the graphics in that paper. And the reason I'm mentioning this is it shows how insidious making something up or asserting something for which you don't have measurements or you lack the data, but you put it forth like this is a known fact can become. And Gary, like many of us, is often asked to talk about breed-based legislation and dog bite issues. And one of the things that even I have said that I have read is that, for example, pit bulls can apply 450 to 600 pounds per square inch of force when they bite. And Gary finally said to himself, is this true? Do we actually know how dogs, hard dogs bite? And let's track this back. So if you look at this very, very, very busy and crazy flow chart, the most recent source is the gray box. So this is 2006, this is 2002 through 2010. Um, and if you then look, the ultimate source from which he traced back the citations to the ultimate source, are these in the black boxes. So this is 1985, 83, 80, 98. This is 2001, 1987. And um, if you, you look at the white boxes, these are the intermediate papers that they went through. So I'm going to take a, a couple of issues here. So here we have um, a quote. This is again, a black box. So um, this is the ultimate, this is the one that started everything. And the gray box is the recent one. So this is a 2009 paper where the chap says, dog bites are frequently complicated with a crush injury as a result of the high masticatory forces that can be delivered by certain breeds. And this is pretty amazing because he comes out with 310 to 31,790 KPA a unit of force, and that's um, that's a hundredfold change depending on the breed. And he cites this paper. This paper, when you go to look at it in the text of the paper, has no discussion of bite source. Okay, now this is very common, and I just nailed somebody for this in a review, where in the paper that was submitted to us, they say that the author said something. The abstract says that. If you look at the entire paper, nowhere in the paper do the authors say that. And in fact, in fact, they refute that. Now I discussed this before. Why are they doing that? Because everybody has access to the abstract. And unless you keep people as an editor honest in the abstract, that's what gets picked up by the wire services. So here's another case where the same chap in an earlier paper is being cited. And, he's, and this guy says, the crushing force between a dog's jaw can generate the pressure of 450 PSI and as much as 1800 PSI in the American pit bull, which by the way, is not a breed. So in his earlier paper, he says, the jaws of a large dog can exert up to 450 PSI enough to penetrate light sheet metal. And that's an unreferenced statement. So he gives no data for that. If you search for that paper, even in government records, you will not find it, okay? And I have looked for it also. So here's another case where this chap says, the biting force of canine jaws can vary from uh, 40, 4.96 PSI, God, I love the lack of significant digits here, to um, easily 100 times that, depending on the breed and the training received. Very important. So now we go to the intermediate ones. This is a 2009 paper, 1994 paper. Considering that the force of the bite impacts, used impact as a verb, at 1,200 PSI, it's not difficult to understand why the circle and bark philosophy is being advocated. Good God, I have no idea what the guy is talking about. I'm reasonably certain neither does he. But if you look at where this came from, they cite this paper. It is from a short article in Sports Sea Edition, Guard Dogs Muscle In on Hulking Jobs. Boy, that sounds like a scientific paper. Published in the Chicago Tribune People. Pay attention. 
Doberman Pinscher grip strength, German Shepherd grip strength, Rottweiler grip strength. No source is cited, but elsewhere the article quotes an individual with one of the largest private suppliers and trainers of police canines in the country. God, with all the pressure labs in the world, at, in physics departments and in mechanical engineering departments, and with all the new strain gauges that the horse people are using, I'd sure get my information from a private contractor. So that was Gary's whole point, is that this is nonsense. We think we know something, and by repeating it, we've made it gospel, and there are no data there. The second lesson is that we need to validate our assessment tools, and we don't usually bother to do this, but in the absence of validation, we need to know if they could be useless, especially if individuals' lives depend on them. For example, those involved in shelters should ask, how good are common temperament tests? Now, this is a paper that was done by Amy Martyr and crew, and Gary Petronic was an author on it, looking at food-related aggression in shelter dogs, and they compared behavior identified by the evaluation in the shelter and by expert reports after adoption. And I just highlight the um, important things here, but instead of going through that, I'm going to show you the actual data so you can work through this logically. Now, in shelters in the United States and many other parts of the world, dogs are assessed with fake hand and the dog is generally tied to the wall, a bowl of food for a hungry dog is put down, and the fake hand, which is attached to the arm of a real person, is used to pull away the food. I can tell you right now that every single dog currently in my household reacts to that, whether or not food is present. So the validation of that as a test has never been adequately accomplished because the false positives are massive. Now you've got a dog who's tied, who can't escape, who may have had a horrible history, we don't know, who's actually hungry and had an unpredictable history of food in his, in his previous life. And you're going to use this in the United States as a decision as to whether or not to kill that dog or keep him in the shelter population. And let me tell you, our local shelters, this is the test that kills the dog. They have to pass this to continue living after three days, okay? So they looked at the number of dogs who reacted to this test in the shelter, and they had um, a total here of 20 dogs who reacted, and they looked at the number of dogs who didn't react to this test in the shelter. So they had 77 dogs who did not react in the shelter test. So they had a total of 97 dogs in this study. Of the 20 who reacted in the shelter, when they sent them home with people, 11 of them reacted to food at home, nine of them did not. Okay, so that's half and half. Of the 77 who did not react in the shelter, 17 reacted at home, 60 did not. Well, this is sort of unexpected, but what does this tell us about how good this test is? Now, those of you who remember basic epidemiological training, remember that the sensitivity of the test is a measure of your true positives. The specificity is a measure of your true negatives. So the sensitivity of this test is only 39%. It does a lousy job of predicting true positives, does a much better job of predicting true negatives. But if you count, if you calculate the negative predictive value of the test, it's 78%. That's sort of eh. If you calculate the positive predictive value of the test, it's 55%. Nobody is going to use this test for HIV detection. Okay. And yet we're killing dogs for it. So, you know, our standards are bad. Our, our definitions are bad. What we think we know, we don't know. And our validation is non-existent. We can't continue doing this in medicine or we're going to be the laughing stocks of veterinary medicine. This is, this is completely inadequate. In Amy Martyr's study, when she looked at the actual behaviors, so growled and showed their teeth, snapped or lunged and bit. So she takes the first two behavioral categories, growl, show the teeth, and then snap or lunge, and then biting. So it got worse in aggression as she went down here. And she looked at never, rarely, sometimes, frequently, always. Well, first of all, nobody did these things always. Nobody ever really, really bit over meals, over delicious things that were exceptional, the occasional dog bit. But what you find out is that most of these dogs, no matter what you do, are not even seriously affected with aggression, and they still die. So Gary Petronic and Janice Bradley reanalyzed all of these data. So using these data, they looked at how that sensitivity and specificity 
compared to other studies. Because the rule of thumb is if you have high sensitivity, you generally have lower specificity. And if you have lower sensitivity, you're not as confident with your true positives, you do better with your false positives. And there are only a couple of studies where you actually do well with certain things um, where you get both of them and you can you can see them here actually urine cultures are the one that you do best with everything coronary ct for coronary artery disease you do well with both of them well here you have an objective measure you count the urine colonies or you don't so they did a, they ran a couple of models and they ran a mathematical model with 100 shelter dogs let's say 16 percent or 16 of the dogs are affected um, with behaviors of concern, and you're going to take a reasonable sensitivity and specificity. This is pretty much the opposite of what Amy's data showed, actually, but this is the one they chose. So this is the best case scenario in a realistic world of the of the data we just showed. 92% for um, predicting the positive part and 36% for flagging the negatives. Well, in a best case scenario, out of 10 dogs who tested positive and were not adopted, eight of them were perfectly fine and you would have killed all of these dogs. Okay, let's say that we actually have the urine culture of the dog world and we're right up here with 85% specificity and sensitivity. Um, in our testing. So of the 10 dogs who were positive and not adopted, and this is the most euphemistically enthusiastic outcome you could expect, you've still killed five dogs out of 10 that were perfectly fine. Then there are some odd findings that people need to consider. And this is a study um, from Emily Weiss of the SPCA and a group at the SPCA who used this test religiously. And they looked at a group of 96 dogs that guard their food bowl during an assessment. And after the study came out, they said, okay, fine, we won't kill these dogs using the safer test. Um, we'll give them some information about food-related aggression. We'll give them some behavior mod. We'll evaluate them at three days, three weeks, three months. And guess what? Um, only six adopters reported an incident of food guarding of the bowl in the first three weeks. And by three months, nobody had any problems. Dogs who had food guarding were returned to the shelter during this period less frequently than dogs who didn't have any food guarding behavior, probably because somebody talked to them a lot. And this mirrors what Amy Martyr ended up by concluding when she talked to the people. They said, yeah, he growls around food, so I leave him alone while he eats, and I let him eat in a protected spot. Nobody had any problems with these dogs once they knew what the situation was and they felt they could manage it. So um, I guess there are two lessons there. One lesson is we should evaluate whether it's really a problem for the dog that the human can't manage. And if the human's devoted, I hate to tell you this, there are almost no problems they can't manage. We do better with psychosis in dogs than we do with psychosis in humans, but it's possible that their people love them far more than they love their human relatives that have that problem. The other thing is that we've based this whole house of cards on a test that was never validated, and we need to stop doing that. So lesson three. Speaking multiple languages requires great observation skills and critical and thoughtful work. How well do the average people speak dog? So this is a study that was done by a group at Columbia, and they looked at human perception of fear in dogs and entitled this that it varies according to experience with dogs. This is an open access paper, um, so you certainly have access to it because PLOS One, all of PLOS One's papers are open access. And these people looked at low experience people, people who had little experience with dogs, little exposure, they didn't own dogs, they weren't professionals, people who were owners, professionals who had a lot of experience with dogs, but had only been a professional for 10 years, um, and for less than 10 years, and people who were professionals for more than 10 years. And they found out a couple of sort of cool things. Um, if you saw how well they matched the behavior to the examples they were given, they were given um, photographic, I think, I don't think video examples, I think it was only photographic examples. But if you look at, they did really well with the happy examples. So pretty much everybody had the same result for a happy dog. We all recognize the absolutely overjoyed dog. We don't do so well with the fearful dog. And the... Um, 
people who will need the most help are the people who have the least experience. So these are the people who are most at risk from these fearful dogs. And owners didn't do as well as they thought they would. They didn't do as well as any of the professionals. So we have to up our game. So we need anticipatory guidance for all of this. So we're this tells you right here, I need to show no other slides about dog bites to tell you that unless we have an integrative care that deals with pediatricians, veterinarians, the public, and people who buy, sell, broker, and or train dogs, we're going to keep having dog bites because we're going to forever have this gap without anticipatory guidance that drags in all the relevant professionals and what is commonly called stakeholders now. So they then look at which signaling modalities did these people have the most trouble with. And again, the happy examples are always the gray bars and the fearful examples are always the black. And they looked at the eyes and people um, do better with fearful eyes than they do with happy eyes, oddly enough. And if you look at the probability of selecting the ears, you see there are differences, but notice for, it doesn't matter whether it's eyes or ears and whether you're happy or you're, you're fearful. Professionals still do better, but they're not doing perfectly either. Um, when you watch the dog's mouth, people did a little better with that, although there was very little difference between the happy and fearful examples. Little difference between using your ability to use the tail, but people more reliably felt they could use a happy dog's tail and a happy dog's legs because then the dog wasn't crouched down. Okay, so being crouched down was something that people did recognize and there was little difference. But you were pretty much all over the place with these signals. So they're not integrating these signals. And when you ask them how difficult it was for them to do this, people who have low experience have difficulty whether or not it's a happy or a fearful dog, but certainly for the fearful dogs, more people tell you it's more difficult. That's really unfortunate because those are the ones we need to read well. And when you look at how mean accuracy, okay, the mean accuracy wasn't actually that great, but it did plateau for the owners who had some experience, professionals of any experience with happy animals and only with the professionals did it plateau for fearful animals. So this gap here is what we have to fill in. And that's that's where the dog bites are occurring. So lesson five. So I've just advocated an integrated and intensive educational plan. Do people actually apply what we try to teach them? And what, what can we say about the special risk of, special case of risk of dogs and kids? So here's a paper that appeared in our journal called The uh, Attitudes of Caregivers to Supervision of Dog, a Family Study in Kids Up to Six Years. And this was a group of people who participated in a short course so that they could learn which behaviors were risky in dogs, okay? And now I'm going, and there were two parts to this study, and I'm only going to tell you about them reading these photos because they were then asked to evaluate a series of five photos, which I'm going to show you. And experts also uh, evaluated those photos and they looked at where they agreed and where they disagreed. And they threw a wrench into the system. They said to these people, we want you to rate this photo and we want you to tell us how much risk pertains to the child if this is an unknown dog to you or a neighbor's dog, or if it's your own dog. Okay, now these people had just taken a very short course in how to minimize risk. So this is the first photo. The child sits next to the dog, the dog's lying on his bed, the child's holding the dog's feet. Do you think this is a safe or a risky situation? I'll show you the answers at the end. This is the second situation. The child standing in front of the dog and lets the dog lick the yogurt cup. Do you think this is a safe or a risky situation? The dog is lying partly uh, on the dog and both of them are squashed into the dog's bed. Do you think this is a safe situation or a risky situation? The dog is lying next to the child's crib um, on a mat in a blanket in the corner, and the child is crawling towards the dog and look at the posturing, look at where the dog is and look at the posturing of the child. Is that a safe or a risky situation? And finally, um, in his imitation of Michael Jackson dangling his daughter off a balcony in France, 
um, the parent is holding this child directly over the head of the dog and the dog is looking up into the child's face as the child waves her hand in the dog's face. Is that a safe or a risky situation? Okay, well, let me, let me end your suspense. Only one of these situations is safe. And in fact, it's the one where the dog is standing in front of the, um, the child is standing in front of the dog and letting the dog lick the yogurt cup. Now, there are a couple of things I want you to pay attention to. Notice how um, people make a huge mistake with the family dog. Half the people, third of the people, third of the people, half the people. These other situations don't think you need to intervene at all if it's their dog. Okay. The tendency to go in the right direction of the experts was pretty good for the appropriate answer. But the people who made the mistakes made grievous mistakes. And they made them in directions that after this course they should not have made. And you see the bias towards the family dog. But there are still some people who would do these things to an unfamiliar dog. So these are people who've had an educational lecture and then they did the kind of thing we always do. We're unwarrantedly optimistic. We always think we can do better than we can. And this is why a one-off course or a one-off dog bite prevention day or dog bite prevention week doesn't work. Why this has to be part of our daily life where we change the way we are. And most of us are pretty lousy at that. Um, but we can do it. Um, people can lose five pounds. They can learn to be mindful. Uh, they can learn to be kinder. We can always be our better selves. So it just tells us that we have work to do in how we present these data. And we need veterinarians and pediatricians to be collaborators. Lesson six, if people relate, repeat a label often enough, um, then that label's valid. This is the case of social structure in dogs. And we're going to take on dominance because I know this is a huge issue. And I'm not going to discuss the whole issue or that would take up the remainder of our time, but I am going to talk about one paper that came out, and I'm going to talk about what they intended and what they did, what that means for their study, and what that means for pet dogs in general, and how we got to the mythology we got to. And these 20 lessons were all arranged in a specific order, starting with reminding you that what we think we know, we don't always know, and that what we measure, we may not have validated, and that how we think about things may be biased. Okay, so now we're going to talk about this inflammatory issue. And this is out of the lab of Joanne Vanderborg and Matthias Schilder, Claudia Vinker and Han de Vries in, um, in Utrecht and uh, Wagenen. And the thing that they set out to ask is something that's not going to be apparent to most people who are not ethologists. And that is their formal dominance in dogs. Now, formal dominance is a concept that says, as they say here, the regularities of winning or losing contests, these repeatable personal asymmetries may be stable for some time. And in formal dominance, they must be stable for some time. And the stability between the relationships between individuals is then correlated with some pattern of social interactions later. So both of those things must be true. And before that, you must have asymmetries in like groups. That's what's not said here, in comparably aged and sexed and socially interactive groups. That is not said here. In formal dominance, you must show that those asymmetries are stable. And then you must show that that stability is then reflected in long-term relationships and outcomes of conflicts. So what I want you to pay attention to is the dogs they did this study on. There are three adult dogs in this study, a 78-year-old, I'm um, 78 month, blah, 78 month old, a 44 month old, and a 24 month old. A 24 month old dog is just reaching or may have just attained social maturity. The 12 and a half month old dog 
is in the midst of pruning his neurons and undergoing a social maturational shift. These are all juveniles or puppies. These dogs are all changing. They're all growing their brains. I wouldn't compare any of these dogs to any of these dogs. And I'll be honest with you. I wouldn't compare these dogs to each other. This is a young adult. This is a middle-aged adult. And this is an older dog. They are all very different. So in my worldview, and I've told the authors this, I know them, I like them, we're friends. Um, I wouldn't have compared those dogs, okay? They end up by finding that two postures, a low on the back and three signals, a, t a low tail wag, a mouth lick, and a pass under the head are what they now call former status symbols of submission. That wasn't mentioned in the formal dominance thing. So now they've fallen into just the traditional dominant submission thing, which was not what they said. They stated in the beginning in their paper that they were going to investigate. And only high posture and body tail wag covered most relationships. And the postural display of lowering of posture was the best form of expressing submission. Oh, is it? Is that truly submission? And then they say the high correlation between the rank orders justifies the use of dominance as an intervening variable to describe the relationships. Well, that would only be true if they had compared like groups, if they had showed that those were good representatives of those agonistic interactions, if those interactions were stable, and then it was an either or situation and those stable ranks sorted dogs always with these behaviors. So let's look at this because the seventh lesson is you need to define what you're studying and measuring, and does the pattern of intraspecific dog play match the hypotheses? So here's a paper that came out in the journal Behavioral Processes. It's called Down But Not Out, Supine Postures as Facilitators of Play in Domestic Dogs. And what these people did was they said, you know, in the absence of anything we could call an agonistic play, an agonistic behavior, Rolling over by the dog, one of the behaviors they looked at in that PLOS One study, determines the bout length of play. So when you roll over, you change the bout length. Most rollovers were defensive to avoid nape bites in play. These are play bites. Or offensive to actually now control the direction the play will be going by launching a play attack. Asymmetries in the performance of the rollovers depended on the play context. <gasps> context just reared its ugly head. So it no longer depends on who's bigger, who's more aggressive, or any of the assertions whose, whose requirements weren't actually met. Now this depends on play context. And rollovers were associated with shortened bout intervals and pauses, but there was no association with any of the traditional measures of submission, including lowering the body and rolling over, or any asymmetries in relationships for these dogs who either knew each other or didn't know each other when they went back and measured them. And you can read the paper. Lesson eight, it's not enough to have a pattern. You need a hypothesis about the direction of the outcome that's internally consistent. And in dog social structures, you have to ask, whether the data support the dogma. And here I think you're going to find they don't. And this is unveiling the secret of play in dogs. And it's talking about asymmetry and signals. It's in the Journal of Comparative Psychology. The one great thing about that PLOS One paper is it spurred all this other work. And it's spurring more work. Trust me, there are a number of papers coming out or in press or uh, where the data are being analyzed. And these people um, looked at 203 play sessions in a park where the dogs routinely went. So most of these dogs knew each other. They probably knew each other to varying degrees. Some of these dogs may have just met, but this was a park where people routinely went. Play asymmetry did not differ between the known and the unknown dogs. So it didn't matter whether it was a recent friend that you just met that morning, or it was a dog you've been coming to the park to for a very long period of time. Um, that didn't matter. So. The asymmetry didn't depend on your knowledge of the individual. In fact, in dominant situations, true dominant situations, it may depend on that knowledge because that knowledge is where you root the history of the asymmetries. 
um, the number of play bows given positively affected the length of play. So the more often you gave a play bow, the longer the play. And you learned from the other people, the more often they rolled over, they stopped it, they got the chance to take it over and, and drive the play if they wanted to, or to continue, it shortened the play. So they have two ways to say, I need to shorten or lengthen this, or I want to shorten or lengthen this, or I want to change who's doing this. Play bows and barks were more common when the soliciting dog could actually see the other. They were facing it. They weren't facing away. Relaxed open mouth displays were not associated and never associated with bites in the study. In short, they could affirm that the play modality in dogs is not necessarily predictive of any serious dominance relationship of the players. Play fighting could have a role in maintaining social cohesion, actually. These are their words, not mine. Rather than to assert and then maintain and in quotes, dominance. In other words, um, if you're looking at the social roles here, they're suggesting that you look at more than fighting or what you perceive to be fighting. And so they're testing whether or not all of these behaviors are actually about fighting. And both of these papers about play showed they weren't. Lesson number nine. Communication is subtle and redundant, and what matters to you may not be what the signals are watching. Use their behaviors to help you translate. This is something that nobody's really looked at because it's hard to do, but this is an experimental study where they took a dog and they put him in an apparatus, which you can see here. You're looking down on the top of the dog, and they measured the deviation of the dog's tail in wagging. And I just want you to think you couldn't do this in a play situation because the dogs have to be constrained to do this type of measurement. But with some clever videoing and a drone, you could do this. OK, so I want you to, to think of what the dogs are seeing that we're not seeing in these signals, because if you have the dog in this and you walk the owner past, the dog almost without exception wags his tail to the right. OK. Um, there's a big difference in left wags and right wags. If you walk an unknown human being past, well, he still wags it to the right, but the difference is less, okay? If you walk no stimulus, it goes in all directions. If you take an unfamiliar dog, this reverses. He now wags to the left more often. And if you take a cat, there's no difference and he doesn't wag very often, okay? That tells you that the dog tells you something because of the direction and the amplitude of their tail wags. And we're missing that, but I doubt other dogs are missing it. Lesson 10, when you label a behavior, you need to define it and put it into a testable context. Are there really calming signals? This is a paper that was written by Chiara Mariti and her colleagues out of Angelo Gazzano's lab at um, PISA last year, and they sought to ask, answer the question, are there really calming signals? Are there signals that exert a calming function, which they defined as de-escalating the aggressive displays of the other dog? They did a series of tests with known dogs, with unknown dogs. Um, this took thousands of hours because they analyzed these videos frame by frame. You see the number of authors in the study. These are students' projects and uh, graduate degrees, and they took thousands and thousands of hours to analyze this video. And they looked at distances, if the dogs were far away, if they were um, at a distance but moderate distance, or if there was no interaction. And uh, what you find out is if they're close, I, I'm sorry, I think I said far away. So if they're close, if they're at a, a moderate distance or if there's no interaction. Uh, if they're close, they tend to turn their heads a lot. If they're at a distance and there's no interaction, they don't. Um, if they are very close, they'll get smaller. They'll lick the other dog's mouth. You couldn't do that if there was no interaction at a distance because you couldn't reach. Yeah, play bows tend to occur at close interactions. Paw lifting, low wagging tails. Remember what we said about low wagging tails, curving, lowering the body. These are low distance things. If you look at what happens when there's no interaction, head turning is a little more common, nose licking, sniffing, sniffing the air, and even softening the eyes. Now, if you compare dogs that are unfamiliar with it versus dogs that are familiar, 
And they did this with a series of known and unknown dogs, and they rotated through four dogs that were known to a bunch of dogs. This was incredibly labor intensive. And if you want to read a well-designed study, this is a beautifully designed study. Um, if you looked at the unfamiliar dogs, boy, you get a lot of head turning then. So if you don't know the dog, you tend to turn your head away to not engage. Um, you get a lot of licking of your own nose if you don't know the dog. You get a lot of freezing if you don't know the dog, a lot of turning away, paw lifting. If it's a familiar dog, though, you can see that there are some things you do exceedingly rarely. Um, you do tend to sit down more often. If it's a more familiar dog, you'll give play bows. If it's a more familiar dog, you might lower your body or go down if it's a more familiar dog. So you see these changes. And when they looked at the actual number of times the analyzed behaviors were displayed after an aggressive interaction, it, the behavior you displayed depended on how well you knew the dog, which is why I said what I said when I said these are the concerns that are the requirements for evaluating formal dominance, which is a very rigorous and narrow interpretation of dominance. So. If you look at this, if the dog was unfamiliar and there was an aggressive display, they freeze a lot. They turn their head away a lot. They turn their body away. They get smaller. If it was a known dog, you lick each other's mouth. You lick your own nose. You blink. You know, you curve. You play bow. Dogs don't exhibit the same behaviors. They don't wag their tails the same. Their brains mature differently. We talked about that for the last few weeks. These are important things to consider. So before I leave dominance, let me say that if you go back to the original dominance literature, which is from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and the mammalian literature is from the 60s and 70s, dominance was a quality that was measured at first and well measured in elephant seals. Male elephant seals are three to four times larger than adult females. And the males fight over who gets to mate with what is called a harem structure. And males are injured. I mean, they could be killed. They seldom are, but they could be killed. They've got big tusks. They're very clumsy. They're very big, very powerful animals. They could sit on a small female and kill her just by sitting on her because they'd smother her. And the person who did that research was very careful because what he also did was he watched the demography of these guys. And he knew that the bigger animal who usually won the conflict was the guy who got to the site first because chances are he'd been the guy who got that site the year before so knowledge was involved the site knowledge of the site was involved the guy was bigger he was older but not too old so in other words he wasn't a young upstart he wasn't a teenager he wasn't a juvenile he wasn't a young adult he was a middle adult he was in excellent health and he was heavier than his competitors. And they used dominant only as the word for the guy who won the conflicts and mated with most of the females. But even then, they knew that a calm, quiet, young male who became friendly with a female would be allowed to mate with her. So what is this system about? Well, this system is about protecting the females from unwanted aggressive courtship because if they're not protected they can't eat and they lose weight and they die how we got to that and then formal dominance in dogs and then people must dominate their dogs to be good to them and to raise them correctly is beyond me but whenever you hear that argument just say to yourself what are they measuring? What are the criteria? What are the conditions for these criteria to be evaluated? What are the predictions explicitly? And will the study produce data where I can evaluate those predictions? And how narrowly do they hew to those conclusions? There were some findings in that PLOS One study that I would have agreed with had they been interpreted more narrowly. But under no condition does any of this stuff have anything to do with the advice that came out of the 1950s when, you know, um, we were all in a cold war and men were men and women were cute and stayed home and we dominated our dogs. This is ridiculous.
Okay, let's move on to lesson 11. We need to pay attention to what's important to the subject and the patients. Dogs are tactile. Why aren't we watching? Okay. So one of the things that I came across was this paper that looked at topography of social touching, and it depends on bonds between humans and how well they know each other. And oddly enough, one of the things that struck me was Robin Dunmar is a primatologist and has been writing about social systems and primates in non-traditional ways for years. So I'm not surprised he participated in this paper. These are uh, a study of, there were a huge number of individuals. Here you go, 1,368 individuals. And these are um, areas where you're allowed to touch them. If you're, these are, this is a male, okay, notice this is a male body. And the taboo regions are the regions in blue. And then where can your partner touch you? Where can a female friend touch you? Where can a male friend touch you? I'm sorry for the red and blue, it's in the paper. But of course, the red is a female touching you, the blue is a male touching you. Um, and then the relationship, your mother who's female, your father who's male, your sister who's female, your brother who's male, your aunt who's female, your uncle who's male, your cousin who's female, your cousin who's male, your acquaintance who's female, your acquaintance who's male, and then strangers who are female. The weird thing is, and strangers who are male, um, men will let anybody touch their genitals, which maybe isn't a shock, but they're not that but they have to be female. They're not that keen to have certain males, no matter how well or not well they may know them, touch them. Um, and they are better with male friends than they are with relatives. But if you look at who you let touch you where, what they found out was these touch indices that they then uh, constructed showed linear emotional bonds with different individuals depending on how you interacted in your participants' networks. And they found out that social touching was linear associate, linearly associated with more positive emotional sensations in closer relationships. And that worked across romantic and non-romantic partners to distant acquaintances. Um, they were dependent of a subject's age, but it talked about how you interacted with individuals socially, who you touched and how you touched them. And we're not looking at that in dogs. What we're looking at in dogs is threats and responses. We're not looking at which dog cares for you when you're ill and what they do, passive affiliations, who teaches you, who sleeps with you, what are your responses to external things, play partners, explorations, grooming, relatedness, food sharing, emergency contact? I have to tell you that unless you look at all of these things, you have no idea what's going on in that relationship. So even if everything that has been said about dominance and, and, and formal dominance was true, it evaluates one dimension of agonistic behavior that may not reflect on all of this. And what you saw in those play studies is people are now trying to work with these others. And until we do that, we're not going to understand how dogs interact with each other or how we should interact with them. Okay, lesson 12 is beware of old assumptions. Animals don't feel pain. That was in the 1700s. Pain's a great immobilizer. That was through the 1980s. I learned that in vet school. And dogs are not cognitive, which some people still think. How can the emergent field of social cognition help us with patients? The first paper on canine cognition was a Brian Hare paper when he was a graduate student at Harvard. And he looked at, he's a primatologist who's interested in the evolution of cognition in primates. And he decided that um, we are the outgroup for chimpanzees because they're our closest primate relative. We share 96% of our DNA with them. And that we would look at dogs pet dogs as the domesticated human version, and then wolves as the outgroup to compare for chimpanzees. And we would ask them to tell us how well they could use cues about finding things that were hidden. And the cues were pointing, knocking, and nodding your head or staring at something. And they expected that um, the chimpanzees, would do what we did and be able to use all of those cues and the dogs wouldn't be able to use any of them. And the upshot of this was the only individual who could use all of those cues were the ones who were domestic dogs. And these were fairly young dogs who hadn't had a lot of exposure to humans. So that started a whole realm of social research that many of us are now involved in. And I, it, 
it really led to the question, when you identify a pattern, uh, you really need to think about the mechanism or mechanistic variation. Do you consider that? Um, responses can be masked or enhanced by experience. So uh, Charlotte Duratin and Florence Gonnet in France looked at effects of shelter housing on how sensitive you were to these cues. Because one of the things um, Udell had, et al. had shown is that pet dogs were really good at pointing trials and shelter dogs who had not had the same relationships with the people who were pointing were not good. So here's a case where these are both domestic dogs, but these dogs would have passed Hare's study and these dogs would have failed. And Hare would have drawn very different conclusions if he'd used shelter dogs for the study. But what's interesting is a number of people then said, well, you're asking them to tell you about something that matters to you. Why don't you ask them to tell you about something that matters to them? So here's the um, unsolvable problem test where there's a bag of food on a shelf here or there's a bag of food over here and it's wrapped up and the dog can't get to it. So in each of these cases, what you find out is that it, rather than staring at the food, which is what you wanted it to do when you pointed, um, the dog stares at the human. And if the human looks at the dog, and these are shelter dogs, these could be shelter dogs, pet dogs, it doesn't matter. They will then stare at the food. So now we've asked the dog what matters to them before we were asking them to tell us what mattered to us. And those are very big differences. And it leads to lesson 14, that there's a case to be made for structured thought, inductive reasoning, and careful design and understanding canine problem solving. And only then will you identify the homologies and convergences in interspecific behavior. One of the best studies, the most fascinating early studies that was done was Julian Kaminsky's study on evidence for fast mapping in dogs. And this is a border collie called Rico that I'm sure many of you heard of because he was all over the popular press. And he knew the labels to over 200 items. So what they would do in trials of 10 in the laboratory with his list of toys and his list of labels, is they would add a new toy that he didn't have and they would give it a random label. And greater than nine times out of 10, he'd bring everything he knew. And when you asked him, no matter how you arranged it in the pile to bring the one he didn't knew, and you'd say to him, go get X, Y, Z, Z, X, he would look at all the things he's brought. He knew the labels to those. He'd look at all the things in the room and say, well, I know that one, and I know that one, and I know that one, and I don't know this one. And this must be X, Y, Z, Z, X. And far greater than nine times out of 10, Rico was able to do this. So they drew some, fat, Kaminsky and colleagues drew some fascinating and very important conclusions. They said that um, you could look at the mechanisms. These are the first people who really talked about mechanism. And uh, you could look at his acquisition of the principle that objects have labels, and that's important. You could look at the general learning mechanism, namely learning by exclusion, i.e. it's not that. I know it's the, I know what this is. I know what this is. I don't know what that is. Therefore, this is the one I don't know, which is exclusion lear learning. And the ability to remember everything so that you can apply that principle. And what that turns out to be is um, something called fast mapping. And fast mapping is the first step in language acquisition in humans. And dogs can do it. And it's how kids learn language. They put together the space between the gaps. And we all do that when we learn foreign languages. It's, it's how we figure stuff out. It's a stage in language acquisition. And dogs do it very, very well. Okay, dogs work for accurate information and uh, aspects of their signaling support this and dogs will test for accuracy with detail and redundancy. So here's another Kaminsky paper that's a much more recent paper. It's an open access paper in the Nature Journal Scientific Reports. It was published just this past, this past summer. And they looked at facial expressions and they looked at something called an inner brow razor muscle. They adapted these from the human facial muscle units, and this is the dog facial action unit. So when you move this muscle, you lift the inner brow region, okay? So if you move the frontalis muscle, you, you lift only the inner brow region where you get that little raise of an eyebrow that we're all so familiar with. And they looked at 
whether the experimenter could elicit this raised eyebrow in two situations where they're facing the dog and paying attention to the dog, where they've got their back turned and not facing the dog. And then they looked at um, two variants on that. When you had food, so you had food in your hand, so the dog knew he would get that. And when you didn't have food. And I think most people would think that if you're standing there with food, the dog will raise his eyebrow, but it's not the food. And this nails that. It's the attention. So a dog's not going to look at you and raise his eyebrow and ask you for interaction. If you're turned away from him, you're not looking at him. But if you look at it, whether or not you have food, he does it. That's an important finding because they say that there are two big findings here. Human attentional state affects the production of these muscles, and it was greatest for this, this one set of muscles, and it wasn't affected by food. So it's really about the communication, and they will tailor their behaviors to the human attentional state, suggesting that communicative function and emotional displays are tied together and based on the dog's arousal state. These are not reflexive systems. They don't automatically do that. They're telling us something and we're missing it. Lesson 16, newer technologies can tell us whether we're the same or different in our information processing skills. So here's functional MRI in awake unrestrained dogs. And many of you may have read Greg Burns' popular book about putting his own dog, this is his own dog, in an MRI unit. He's an economist who does neuroimaging at uh, Emory University. And they gave the dog um, two signals. They gave them, and I unfortunately don't show you the signal. Um, they gave them, uh, yes, you're going to get a food reward signal, or a crossed hands, no, you're not going to get a food reward signal. There are only two dogs in this first study. And they evaluated the caudate nucleus, which is where you process information about good things that you might consider a reward. And if they look at um, this first dog, you see that the caudate nucleus spikes when they're telling the dog in the different trials, yes, you're going to get the signal. and it drops when it tells them, nope, no reward for this. And when they combine the two dogs, even with all the variation, yes, you're going to get a reward when this is done. No, you're not going to get a reward. And their caudate nucleus does not light up. So the dogs are making the distinction between the signals and they're making the distinction functionally in the region of the brain that sets them up for expecting the reward. That's important because it tells you how to communicate with your dog. Dogs choose accurate information over markers for information. Ah, what's a marker? A marker is a clicker, it's a food treat, it's a ball. But I'm going to argue, as I have always argued, because I was classically trained as an ethologist by somebody who did communication theory and it rubbed off, that we all work, all social individuals work for accurate information. And the reason we have so much trouble understanding dogs is we don't understand that they just want us to let them know what's going on. Same group, they did 15 dogs in an awake functional MRI. They again use the ventral caudate nucleus stimulation as a measure of a reward. And then they asked the dogs to do different things. They asked them to respond to uh, praise given by the owner. So the owner would tell them going through a fence which way to go. Um, and praise them at the end of it, or if they went through this fence structure, they could get a reward without the owner praising them. The owners were there when this was done, but the owners didn't interact with them in the food reward. And in fact, if you had the dog work their way through the maze and the owner praised them, 13 of the 15 dogs had greater activation in the caudate nucleus for praise over food. Why? Because those dogs are using the verbal signal as a validator of information. You can certainly teach a dog to use food that way, but please don't underestimate the importance of information to dogs. And praise may be the first information from their owners that really makes a difference. And we're always telling dogs what not to do. Instead, every second of the day, we should be telling them they're brilliant. I always tell people to tell them they're brilliant when they're sleeping. They're not causing any trouble when they're sleeping. 
my dogs are told thousands of times a day that they're brilliant, that they're cute, that they're smart, that they're perfect, that they're doing exactly what I want them to do. And I have some of the most plastic dogs I've ever met. Lesson 18, understanding how dogs learn should improve handling and training styles and should inform us about our aggressive and troubled patients. Well, I just told you to tell dogs what to do, what not to do. But again, we see this French group looking at the effects of forceful training on how well dogs respond and what behaviors they give. Now you've seen that everybody has now said that low posture is a form of being concerned. It could be a stress-related behavior. You've heard the Dutch group call it a submissive posture, um, but it's generally regarded by the stress physiologist as a stress behavior. Gazing towards the owner is asking for information. They're not even using punishment here. They're using negative rewards where you ignore the dog if they don't do what you want. Positive rewards, you give them something if they do what you want. So if you use negative rewards, you get a predominance of lower body postures. If you use positive rewards, you almost never get them. If you use positive rewards, the dogs gaze towards you. If you don't give them information, they don't look to you for information. Negative reinforcement is an absence of information. I don't know why people think this is not doing harm, but by and large it is. So they showed that more dogs trained with negative reinforcement-based systems showed more signs of stress compared with dogs trained with other measures, not just low body postures, but mouth licks, yawning, and stress behaviors that were pooled. This was followed up by uh, a review of all of the training studies by Gal Ziv, who found out that it didn't matter what study you looked at, people who used positive reinforcement um, had better outcomes than people who used positive punishment and negative reinforcement, period. The dogs did better. They were less at risk for relinquishment. They were less at risk for aggression. We don't know why anybody's still using these methods. Which brings up a paper that was just published at the end of last summer that showed one important finding of these positive punishment measures. And that's that when, this came out of PennVet, Carlos Syracuse's paper, when you looked at dogs that people were considering relinquishing or killing, the owner associated variable included the use of punishment-based training and previous consultation with a non-veterinary behaviorist or a trainer. Why? Why both of these? Because the trainer or the non-specialist behaviorist is most likely to use punishment or negative reinforcement. And that adds to the risk of death or euthanasia for these dogs. And that's an important finding that everybody should know. Lesson 19, we need to incorporate behavioral assessment into every appointment. This is an older paper of ours where we looked at 141 dogs who came in sequentially into a behavior clinic and screened every one of them for separation, anxiety, and noise phobia, and we found something stunning, that the probability of you having separation anxiety and a reaction to some noise was far greater than it should have been if those associations were random. So something about reacting to noise affects other anxieties. And if you don't specifically ask people in a structured questionnaire about specific responses to all noise situations and all anxiety situations, you miss this. And then you go to treat an anxiety and dogs don't get better. And that's what caused me to do this study because I suddenly realized that I was missing the noise component. And when I pushed and I pushed and I pushed, the dogs who weren't responding to drugs also reacted to noise. And that was the stimulus for doing the study. Stimulus for doing the study was something I had not done, and I realized my mistake and I changed it. And that has led to a whole series of noise studies, including one we published at the end of 2016 on looking at breeds. And we found out a couple of interesting things. We found out that um, pretty much what you get at two years of age is what you're going to be, whether it's storms, fireworks, or gunshots. Didn't matter whether you were Border Collies or Australian Shepherds. These are pretty flat curves. You may get a tiny bit worse with age, but boy, by two years of age, 
if you're reactive to noises, you stay reactive to noises. You don't get spontaneously better. And you don't get spontaneously worse, oddly enough. Um, this was not a study that followed dogs through time, so individual dogs may get worse through time. We did see a peak in border collies um, for a slightly later age, but it wasn't a significant enough to go with the rest of the population for us to say that there is an age penetrant trend. Following dogs through time, though, could change my mind. But we also found out something very interesting is when we compared the border collies and the Aussies, they were very similar to each other, whether it was... Uh, didn't matter what the stimulus was. It didn't matter if it was uh, noise, storms, guns. It hardly mattered. But here, um, German shepherds did not exhibit the same behaviors that Australian shepherds and border collies exhibited. Border collies and Australian shepherds panted. Um, they hid. They escaped. They salivated. They trembled. German Shepherds paced, and they're all herding dogs. And both of these other dog breeds were supposedly derived from German Shepherds. So it's extremely important to find out, especially if you're doing genetics, what behaviors they do, because they may be controlled by different genes. And finally, we asked about noise reactivity in auditory findings, and we found out something very bizarre in a problem study, problem solving study for which data are still being analyzed and will be for a couple of years because I'm analyzing them all by myself. Um, we ended up with dogs who reacted to noise who had a very different response to the bear test in wave five. They had a hemispheric difference in how they responded. That suggests a possible mechanism suggesting that you're affecting hemispheric information transfer. But we don't know that. This is not a finding we were expecting to have, and we've not yet been able to get funding to test this. We also found that in the group of dogs who reacted to noise and those who didn't react to noise, we couldn't even test a, stati a statistically significant proportion of the dogs who reacted to noise because they couldn't sit still long enough to be tested. So the noise reactivity isn't just, oh, he just reacts to storms. No, I'm sorry. He's reacting in daily life. He's, he's aroused at everything. He can't sit still to have lidocaine cream and dog put on his skin so he could have an electrode placed on it and dog treats given to him. These dogs are suffering. And given what we've learned about canine signals and the prevalence of canine related behavior, uh, anxiety related behaviors, should this influence how we practice? And this is my last lesson. We're scaring the hell out of the patients we treat, and we're helping to create anxiety related problems that may contribute to the physical conditions. This is a, a series of studies that Bjorn Forkman's lab's been involved in, and they realized that people were pretty good at evaluating pain, but they were lousy at evaluating stress. So they thought the dogs were just fine, same as, oh, noise phobic dogs are just fine. So they found that dogs were less likely to play and take a treat inside the clinic than outside. The simple difference of going through the door was profound, suggesting that the dogs themselves experienced the inside as more negative, and they said that the examination itself is perceived negatively by the dogs and more negatively than the waiting room or outside, and that we need to be mindful of that. And this then backs up what um, this group uh, out of Germany found about doing a standardized exam where they pet the dog and its shoulder, its chest, its neck, its the paw lying on the ground, the head, the tail, the collar, handling the dog's muzzle. And they looked at heart rate variability. And in general, when behavioral measures of stress are absent, heart rate variability increases. Your heart rate's more variable. It's very predictable and less variable when stress is present. And these other measures change accordingly. And they found out that we're all doing this wrong. We should be touching the dog on the chest to lower its heart rate. And then we also get statistically significant changes in the other factors that are calculated. And that displacement activities, that if the dog was able to twitch or move around or scratch, if he wasn't prohibited from doing it, it lowered his stress level. But in fact, dogs that froze or dogs that withdrew had much 
higher stress levels because these were negatively correlated with RMSD. And if you're negatively correlated with this, that means this is increased and stress is present. Okay, so remember what we said earlier about touching. We don't know how to touch dogs. Touch them on the chest. We all touch them on the head. They're not too keen for that. So my final words for today are that more dogs and cats are killed and relinquished each year because of behavioral problems than die from neoplastic, cardiac, and endocrine disease combined. Most veterinary schools still don't have a full-time clinical and didactic and research program in this field, and I fault them for that. The future patients are ending up as compost. We are not doing a good job of training our students. We are not doing a good job of training our colleagues. We are not doing a good job of building this field, and we are not doing a good job of being more humane. Every veterinary school should have that three-pronged faculty member and a resident or two, and maybe another faculty member. Most of the findings in this talk are not published in the basic veterinary medical literature, so they're not available to veterinary professionals. They're published in the basic science literature. So they're not, they're only read by researchers. They may be read by specialists. They're certainly not read by veterinarians. This science is just now being developed coincident with clinical behavioral science. The burden is on us to pay attention and to become educated so that we can be our best selves for our patients and the most compassionate thinkers we can be. Our patients, it doesn't matter if it's a seal or a turtle or a dog or a cat or a bird or a horse or an animal going to slaughter, they need that compassion. Science can give us that. We just need to build that science and our awareness of it and use it. You're more than welcome to contact me. I do answer my emails. A number of you have, and I have answered. This is the journal in the field which I edit. You can get a discount if you join one of the affiliated organizations. We've already had a number of people ask about participating, and a couple of you sign up for the course in May. Um, it's an intensive four-day course, three specialists, 12 hours a day, behavioral medicine all the time, lectures, labs, hands-on demonstrations, free-for-all discussions, best learning and teaching experience most participants have ever had. And thank you very much, Alice, and I'm uh, sorry I'm a few minutes over. Thank you, Karen. Um, there's a, co a comment here. I'm not sure if it's a comment or a question. Okay. Um, it's about a study, I think it was when you were talking about the Kaminsky, Kaminsky study on human attention affecting mm -hmm. facial expression. Yeah. And the, the person said um, that people weren't looking at dogs in the study, they were staring straight ahead at the wall over the dog's head. Does that make That's sense? That's right. Yes, they were. They were staring straight ahead, but they were facing the dog. So mm -hmm. the do they were facing or facing away so that they could separate out the soliciting component from the human, which if you had looked at the dog, you would have the soliciting component versus the dog knowing that I can't signal to you my needs. I can look at your face and maybe out of the corner of your eye, you'll look at me. And this was a, mo this was a signal that was intentional and it was intentional to get that contact. Okay. And that is, and I glossed over that because I was watching the clock and I'm sorry, I was careless there. So thanks for calling me on that. And you see in the photo I showed you, the people were, st the little line drawing, they were staring straight ahead because otherwise they would have confounded the solicitation cue with the dog. Here we're asking, remember what Kaminsky's always asking, what matters to the dog? So what matters to the dog is, okay, I can see you. Now I'm going to raise my eyebrow and I'm going to look at your face. So without even being prompted, the dogs looked at the face and you only got the eyebrow raise of that uh, muscle, that inner muscle in those situations. And food didn't matter, but you didn't get it at any kind of high level when the back was turned. Okay. And there's a comment. It was actually Kat Littlewood in New Zealand who asked that question. She says, thanks for explaining. So. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for bringing it up and making it more clear. Um, okay. So um, I, it's my pleasure to thank you, Karen, for um, another really fascinating uh, webinar. What an interesting collection of um, questions and findings to consider and the data to support them. Um, a lot to digest but I think it could help us all um, practice much more humanely as, as you want to encourage. So thanks everybody for joining the webinars.
Um, I'll mention again that I'll be sending the uh, handout and there will be a little survey you'll receive along with your recording. So please answer it and please provide us with suggestions for future webinars. Thank you very much and, and thank you to you, Karen. Thank you, Alice, for setting this up. I think it's been a, it's been a great experience for me anyway. Thank you. Good. Okay. I'll sign us all off now. Bye. Bye-bye.